Thomas More, Utopia. In this lecture, we consider one of the great works of Western civilization, Thomas More's Utopia, first published in Latin in 1516 and soon translated into Europe's major languages. Utopia combines wittiness and humanist learning with Christian insight. Utopia, meaning no place in Greek, is not a blueprint for a political order, but does invite reflection on the way a virtuous society comes into being. Its call for common ownership of property has lent itself to communist thought. Karl Marx quotes from Utopia in Das Kapital. But Moore's purposes were subtler, even satirical. Utopia is a literary mirror, a funny mirror for his own English society to reflect upon itself. Are its laws virtuous? Are they grounded in the principles it claims to hold as a Christian nation? Utopia is a critique, but also a call to reform. Moore was concerned with the growth of a depressed underclass in a nation claiming to be Christian. In composing Utopia, he invites reflection on good governance, the goal of which is not only the establishment of justice, but also the promotion of universal virtues inspired by Christianity, to keep people from deviancy and also to rouse those in power to work for the relief of poverty and misfortune. The solution Utopia proposes is unorthodox, the abolishment of private property. The idea is that without private property, greed would be unable to take root in the human soul and a charitable disposition towards others would naturally flourish in the human heart. The idea of abolishing private property is as old as Plato's Republic and features in the founding texts of Christianity. The Acts of the Apostles has this to say of the first followers of Christ. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all according to need. Life on the island of Utopia recalls this early Christian communal practice. Some Utopians, it is related, were drawn to Christianity for the resemblance of its teaching to their own life. Still, Moore's purpose is not constitutional. He is satirizing his own society where the avarice of the 1% endangers the good of all. How can society be saved from its own baser inclinations? The main character, a fictitious figure by the name of Raphael Hithloday, gives voice to the central theme of the book, saying, But as a matter of fact, my dear Moore, to tell you what I really think, as long as you have private property, and as long as money is the measure of all things, it is scarcely ever possible for a commonwealth to be just or happy. The idea is that acquisitiveness knows no bounds. As a result, the very existence of private property generates a plutocratic oligopoly, where a handful of men share a nation's wealth, leaving the rest in poverty. In such a system, the poor are always at risk of being exploited by the rich. In other words, as long as there's private property, there can be no justice. In turn, if you eliminate private property, there'll be no acquisitiveness, no greed for more possessions. All will be satisfied with what they have. Indeed, there will be no way to acquire more things, all things being held in common. The basic message of Utopia recalls the thought of St. Ambrose, Bishop of Milan in the 4th century, who saw the institution of private property as a direct consequence of the fall. Avarice, Ambrose taught, is inflamed by gain, not diminished by it. Utopia is thus part of a long tradition of Christian thought that sees private property as a cause of injustice in society and of the perversion of goodness in people's hearts. In this sense, monastic life, where all is held in common and none is left in want, would become a concrete Christian response to the evil inclinations that invariably get quickened by the drive to acquire wealth. In addition to its critique of a polity that calls itself a commonwealth, but where wealth is not shared in common, Utopia raises questions about the nature of governance. Is it a necessary evil? In other words, is governance essentially a kind of violence that exists to suppress other kinds of violence? Here, governance gets designated as legitimate violence, while the violence that people would use against one another in pursuit of their private interests, in the absence of any restraining force, gets designated as illegitimate violence. In this sense, governance is a necessary evil to overcome a greater evil, its essential purpose being to punish. Or do the institutions of governance exist to cultivate virtues in the citizenry, not to punish them but to reform them through education and training in crafts and industries, so as to keep them from idleness and the waywardness that results from it. In this sense, governance is seen to exist to help bring about the salvation of human souls. The goal of Utopia is to offer advice to those holding the reins of governance in England. Are you not charged with the governance of a Christian nation? Or are you in it only for your own enrichment and imperial glory at the expense of the needs of the underclass, 
merely pretending to uphold justice by executing swift punishment on criminals while in fact doing nothing to reform the idol and elevate the conditions that turn people to crime in the first place. Utopia is not a manifesto for revolution, but a call for political reform, for governance not by the dictates of real politic, but in accordance with the humanist expressions of Christian wisdom. Thomas More, saint and martyr, was born in 1478 and beheaded in 1535 by Henry VIII for refusing to support the act of succession that made the offspring of Henry and Anne Boleyn legitimate heirs to the crown. More was a consummate humanist, committed to both classical and biblical literature, much less so to the sophistical ways of scholastic philosophy. Erasmus of Rotterdam, the leading humanist of Northern Europe, would find great inspiration in his friendship with More. All of this might seem rather contradictory. Thomas More, a highly learned figure who was willing to die rather than recognize the right of Parliament to declare Henry VIII supreme head of the Church of England, and yet who deeply relished the study of the humanities, including the pagan literature of ancient Greece and Rome, and saw it as a source of wisdom from which the Church itself could draw great benefit. More is the quintessential exemplar of theohumanism for his willingness to see divine grace in the workings of our own human nature including the very things we as humans take greatest delight in. The relation of divine grace in human nature has occupied excessive attention in the history of Western Christianity since the time of Augustine. Is human nature so depraved that nothing short of God's grace is needed to redeem it from its intrinsic evilness? Moore was certainly not naive to the evil potential of the human soul, but as a humanist he was ready to consider a close association between the workings of divine grace and those of human nature, rather than a fundamental opposition between the two. For him, humans by their very nature can come to know and be attracted to a life of goodness and charity. Indeed, he speaks of humanity as a virtue proper to humans, nothing being more humane than to relieve the misery of others and help them to know joy. The theohumanist point here is more suggestion that we live as Christians when we live according to the purpose of our own humanity in solidarity with society as a whole. To step back for a moment, Christianity speaks of divine grace as the outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon creation entire. Thomas More, a pious Christian, saw the Eucharist, that is the Mass, as the means by which the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, continues to be poured out upon creation for its renewal. But for him, this was not abstract theology. It was to take concrete expression in the world in the way society's members serve one another, especially the least among them, in echo of the 25th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus defines service of others as the criterion for entry into his kingdom. Did you feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the sick? Thus, for Thomas More, life in the kingdom of God is not reducible to pious devotion. It is necessary to look to human nature itself as source of those virtues that bring about happiness in society in echo of the purposes of God as made known by the message of Christianity. The link between humanist impulse and Christian teaching is implied in the discussion on pleasure in Utopia. There, Hitler Day speaks of the people of Utopia as being guided by pleasure. We use the word pleasure with varied meanings, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. There is immediate pleasure and delayed pleasure. We speak of mental pleasure, physical pleasure, and spiritual pleasure. There is the pleasure of novelty, the pleasure of mastery, the pleasure of intimacy, and the pleasure of nostalgia. You will want to read closely the discussion on pleasure in Utopia to understand what exactly Moore means by it. Suffice it to say that he sees it in relation to the virtuous life, ultimate human happiness, and the common good in society. In short, the pleasure that humans are attracted to by nature is purposeful and leads us to act with charity towards others. However, greed, spurred on by private property, distorts the delights to which we would naturally incline. We are made to think that pleasure lies in wealth rather than sacrifice for others. For Thomas More, not all pleasures are the same. Some are true and some are false. Ultimately, for the people of Utopia, what brings about pleasure and happiness is sacrifice for others. Hitler Day puts it this way, To pursue your own pleasure by depriving others of theirs is unjust, but deliberately to decrease one's own pleasure in order to augment that of others is a work of humanity and benevolence which never fails to reward the doer over and above his sacrifice. Your mind draws more joy from recalling the affection and goodwill of those whom you benefit than your body would have drawn from the things you gave up. In other words, when it comes to the dictates of our own humanity, 
The pleasures that give joy to the soul are weightier than those that give joy to the body. Thus, underlining this discussion of pleasure is a remarkably theo-humanist message, that it is through the pursuit of what gives us greatest delight, as measured by the workings of our very own nature as human beings, that we follow the Christian life. What does Utopia suggest about the relation of Christianity to humanity and even to our cosmos, the contemplation and reverence of which Utopians see as acts of worship? Utopia opens with a conversation set in Antwerp between Thomas More and Raphael Hitlerday, who recounts his remarkable travels around the world and his observations of life on the island of Utopia. To give a semblance of reality to his fantastical discoveries, it is reported that he began his voyage in the company of Amerigo Vespucci, the Florentine explorer who made four voyages to the New World between 1497 and 1502. Utopia, then, was written at the dawn of Europe's age of discovery. Many took it to be a factual account of life in the New World. The conversation between Moore and Hitler Day extends across the two books of Utopia. The first book is a critique of English society, the second, explanation of life on the island of Utopia, as proof that people will vigorously pursue happiness, even if the motive to acquire wealth is eliminated. In that sense, the description of Utopia is but a foil for the situation in England, a mirror for Englishmen to consider themselves. By having Hitler Day do all the talking, more carefully distances himself from the critique of governance in England and the call for its reform. He had gotten into trouble in 1501 when, as a new member of Parliament, he opposed the large and unjust sums of money that Henry VII sought to extract from the people. The context of the critique is a conversation Hitler Day recounts having had with John Cardinal Morton, a former patron of Moore's as Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor of England until his death in 1500. Present in the conversation is a layman, unnamed, who praises the country's severe penalties for crime, especially the policy of executing thieves. This prompts Hitler Day to expatiate on the evils of governance in England. He begins by noting how idleness is encouraged, first by failing to retrain soldiers of the king's wars when they return to society, and second by the large numbers of servants whom greedy noblemen employ for a period of time, only to turn out without having taught them employable skills. As a result, these former retainers, along with veterans of war, are left with no choice but to starve or steal. And when they do steal, they are swiftly executed. What could be a grosser perversion of injustice? As Hitler Day puts it, if you do not find a cure for these evils, it is futile to boast of your justice by punishing theft. Your policy may look superficially like justice, but in reality it is neither just nor practical. What else is this, I ask, but first making them thieves and then punishing them for it? Hitler Day presses the point. Not only is such a system of governance unjust, it is also a transgression of God's law. According to the Law of Moses, as recorded in the 22nd chapter of the book of Exodus, the punishment for theft is a fine, not death, and this is to say nothing of the new law inaugurated by Christ. What's more, in addition to being at odds with the law of God, the system of governance in England is not even rational. The harsh penalties do nothing to deter crime. It's not as if people have a choice not to steal. It would be better to put them in work camps and offer them a chance at rehabilitation, as was the practice in ancient Rome. Indeed, governance in England serves only the interests of the few, a far cry from the Christian nation it is supposed to be. As Hitler Day puts it, if we dismiss as out of the question and absurd everything which the perverse customs of men have made to seem alien to us, we shall have to set aside more of the commandments of Christ, even in a community of Christians. This raises the question, is there place for the Christian humanist in English society? or is the Christian humanist better advised to withdraw from society rather than hope for its reform? One can hear Moore's own frustrations behind the words of Hitler Day. Should the Christian humanist, learned in philosophy, history, classical and biblical literature, and the ways of virtue, withdraw from the sordidness of public life? Thomas More was too committed to active participation in civic affairs. He greatly admired the monastic life and had considered entering a community of monks. The reason given for his decision not to do so is his own admission that he would not easily have met the demands of chastity. Better to marry than lose one's morals as a monk. However, given his devotion to civic virtue, Moore's choice for public life over the contemplative life of the monastery cannot be reduced to his sexual needs. 
the humanist impulse of the age that marked his own education worked to steer him towards a career in which he labored to shape a virtuous society even to the point of surrendering his own life rather than submitting to a policy he judged detrimental to the spiritual vigor and moral character of England. All of this is to suggest that utopia is Thomas More's humanist way of counseling the realm to reform its ways. Its economy is controlled by rapacious landowners with no sense of obligations to those residing on their lands. Rather, by fencing off the nation's lands, they monopolize agriculture and wool manufacture and manipulate the prices of basic necessities, driving the country to ruin. And the king is led not by any responsibility to care for the peoples under his rule, but only by his need to finance his military aspirations. Taxes are raised, money flows out of the country to hire foreign mercenaries, and the blood of the nation's sons is shed not in defense of the common good, but for the vainglory of the king. The nation is ground down, the economy is exhausted, and people are demoralized to no higher purpose. As Hitler Day recounts the unfortunate state of the nation, he asks, over Moore's protests, what point it would serve to offer advice to the nation's ruler from his wide learning and extensive experience. Who would listen to him, he asks, if he were to suggest that people are to choose a king for their own sake, not for his, and therefore that they have a right to dismiss him when he fails the common good. The only solution he maintains is to do away with private property. Hitler Day realizes he will be mocked for the idea. Wouldn't people grow idle without the motive to acquire wealth? Hitler Day retorts, He has visited a place, the island of Utopia, where private property is abolished and the people are not at all idle. Quite the opposite, they are models of efficiency, with plenty of time for learning and recreation, although not the immoral kinds such as the gaming, drinking, hunting, and whoring, all too familiar in England at the time. The happiness of society in Utopia comes not from acquisition, but the pursuit of pleasure of the highest order. Over the course of Book Two, Hitler Day gives a detailed description of life on the island of Utopia. At times it seems like summer camp with a plethora of edifying activities waiting to be enjoyed, at other times, it seems like a socialist commune where everyone works the land in two-year cycles while also learning another trade when not employed in agriculture. All dress alike to mitigate envy and greed, except for those in the learned class, political leaders who are elected, and priests who oversee the education and moral life of the island as well as presiding over its worship. Money is not used since all is held in common and used for common purpose, and to encourage disdain for the precious metals worshipped in other lands, it is the practice in Utopia to use gold to make chamber pots and the fetters of slaves. Society in Utopia is organized into cities spread across the island, and any shortage in one city is offset by surpluses in others. In general, the system of governance keeps people busy. They're not always working, but they're never idle. When people go wrong, the goal is to rehabilitate them by demoting them to the status of bondsmen and sending them to work in labor camps. But they can return to society if they show by their behavior that they regret their crime. There is no wealth disparity and thus no greed and no fear of want, but also no chance of loafing. A humanist education, free of useless theological speculation, is given to the youth, its essential purpose being to cultivate virtue in the citizens. Remarkably, citizens are free to choose their own beliefs. The religious freedom enjoyed on the island of Utopia has generated much discussion, especially since Moore, in his capacity as Lord Chancellor, showed a willingness to use force against Protestantism in England. Did he change his attitude on tolerance in the face of Protestant beliefs? Or does Utopia stand as a pioneering argument for religious tolerance over a century and a half before John Locke's famous letter on toleration of 1689? The people of Utopia are expected to hold some beliefs in common. Belief in God as sole creator and author of life, divine providence rather than chance, the immortality of the soul, and judgment of one's actions in this life with rewards and punishments in the next. Beyond that, the citizens of Utopia are free to believe what they want, and they are free to persuade others of the truth of their beliefs. The bottom line is that beliefs are obligatory insofar as they serve the common good, voluntary thereafter. Indeed, the only form of piety forbidden on the island is fanaticism, religious zealotry that would set people against one another and upset the moral harmony of society. This sheds light on Moore's own humanist thinking on religion. Again, utopia is not a literal representation of how things should look in reality, but rather a set of odd illusions to make one think about one's own society. After all, some of the practices on utopia, such as divorce and euthanasia, did not square with church teachings. 
Moore is thus not describing the ideal Christian society, but he is poking fun at a scholastic mindset obsessed with irresolvable theological conundrums. Do angels have bodies? How exactly did Christ descend into hell? Conundrums that only sow discord in society to the detriment of the common good. Beliefs on the island of Utopia speak to Moore's own sense of himself as a Christian humanist. Christianity exists not to engender endless theological disputation, but to get people to be good, not for dogmatic supremacy, but to foster virtue. This does not make all belief a personal matter. All are required to believe in reward and punishment in the next life as a spur to good action in this one. All find great edification in the worship of the one God and the confession of their sins. In other words, beliefs exist for the reform of society, not for its fragmentation into sectarian squabbles. Moore recognized the authority of the church, but embraced a humanist concept of salvation, based on virtuous behavior rather than knowledge of elaborately intricate theological systems, and he had little tolerance for those who claimed that they alone had the formula for salvation. Moore was thus calling for church reform prior to the rise of Protestantism in those areas that created division in the believing community and harmed the moral harmony of the nation and he would take the same view towards what he viewed as the zealotry of Protestants and their claim to be the elect, rather than a community of sinners like the rest of us. Thus, both before and after the rise of Protestantism, Moore took a dim view of theological pride. Church teachings were, for Moore, essential for salvation, the sacraments, moral instruction, and even miracles. But to theologize beyond the basics and to claim certainty for one's own theological musings, this, for Moore, was sheer pride, no less a threat to the common good than the personal pride the rich took in their possession of wealth. It wasn't incumbent upon Christians to accept a host of logical propositions on obscure theological problems to attain salvation. They had a right to their conscience, but not to laud it over other Christians with different opinions. In short, Christians aren't to be condemned when they say they are Christians. Moore's utopia is enigmatic. What's its real message? Here, we have suggested that it's best to read it as one would look into a funny mirror. It's not you, but it is meant to make you think about you. And the thinking that Moore seeks to prompt is theo-humanist to the core. The book asks us to think about the nature of governance and its purposes, but even more so about the nobility of our own humanity, which Moore saw as nothing less than God's way of leading us to fulfill his purposes of kindness and charity towards all. Standing in the way of those purposes is the evil of private property. Moore offers the antidote to the poison, pleasure. To make yourself happy, help others. It's not simply the mark of Christian life, it's a delight. There is irony in the message, but irony of the theo-humanist kind that we would do well to ponder today.